Good evening, everyone. My name is Katarini Wright, and I'm the current president of the ASID NICID Student Chapter 2014. I'm extremely delighted to be here, and I'm very grateful for all those who gave us support. I would like to thank you for attending this event and share with you that it has been a great experience being the president of this student chapter. We have an engaged group that demonstrates their passion and drive for the design community. Since last year, I got the opportunity of representing internationally the artist Ciron Franco, one of the most prestigious contemporary artists from Brazil, which his works is currently displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I realized that I didn't know where to start, and I found myself with so many questions in how to develop connections and deliver his works into designers. That's when we gather our group and we realize that we do have many challenges that we must be familiarized ourselves with in the art business. As interior designers, this is highly essential. I'm extremely honored to present the following speakers. Patrick James Hamilton. <laughs> Elizabeth Sabaf. And Christine Berry. Patrick Hamilton is a taste maker, interior designer, writer, humorist, and activist. His interior design blog, Ask Patrick, was nominated last year for the Best Writing Award for Designers Blog's Halls of Fame. In his design work, Hamilton demonstrates his signature, invest, splurge, and save approach, creating environments that are functional, comfortable, and highly expressive of his clients. Patrick has appeared on HDTV and printed in virtual pages of House Beautiful, Apartment Therapy, Kitchen.com, and American Baby. He's participated in panel discussions at the Scope Art Fair, moderated an event last year at the DMD Building's Spring Market, and just spoke on a panel at the Architectural Digest Home Show as part of the New York Times Designer Seminar Series. This spring, Patrick will be participating in the fourth Design on a Dime event, benefiting Housing Works. And in this past December, he completed his first room at the prestigious Holiday House. Elizabeth Sadov's mission is to connect the work of emerging and mid-career artists with prospective collectors unfamiliar with the acquisition process, seeking guidance in developing the personal aesthetic. The art world imploded following the global financial meltdown, and Sadoff realized that the artists and states underrepresented in the contemporary art market needed new avenues through which to bring the art world to the public. She concluded that contemporary interior designers understand the essential impact artwork has on their designs. And more than ever, they are indispensable conducts for getting artwork into the public realm. As a result, Sadov's clientele are primarily interior designers, which, is, which includes Carrier and Company, James Rixner, Celery Campbell, Katie Linden, and Daryl Smith. Sadoff is a member of the Art Table as a co-chair for Bellary's House auction since 2011. She helps to raise funds and provide permanent housing and other vital services to homeless New Yorkers with HIV. Elizabeth's Art Advisory is a full-service art advisory firm specializing in art selection and placement for interior design and architectural firms a Manhattan-based firm that promotes emerging and mid-career artists, leading sculptors, painters, and photographers of our time, as well as artist states. 
ESAA has an art rental program that creates and publishes custom bound books for art enthusiastic collections. Christine Berry, she became her career. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, she became her career at the Modern Museum of Art uh, of Fort Worth and then continued to the Whitney Museum of American Art. Christine was a director at a major Midtown gallery for over 10 years, where she created solo exhibitions by Dan Christensen, Malcolm Green, Paul Fine, and Stephen Pace. She is now the co-owner of Barry Kimball Gallery, located at 530 West 24th Street, on the ground floor of the heart of Chelsea. Mary Campbell features post-war, modern, and contemporary art with a focus on established and mid-career contemporary artists. The gallery represents Edward Avdigan, Walter Darby Barnard, Eric Dever, Ken Greenleaf, Raymond Handler, William Perdoff, M. Purcell, and Susan Vassy. Barry Campbell Campbell's exhibition, Water Darby Banner, Dragon Water, was recently chosen as the critic's picks for David Cohen's crit artcritical.com. Christine continue continues to place artwork in the world's foremost public and private collections. So let's start discussing about how to link in art business into interior design. I think it's it's the it's where the personality comes from. I think it's where the personality of the room. Can everybody hear? First of all, thank thank you for coming on this like the first spring actual spring night. But, like we we welcome your <laughs> presence here even more than normal. But anyhow, um, I think it's where the personality of a room comes from. I think it's where the I think it's it's the best indicator of a client's personality. Very often in a room, I think you can walk into a room and there's usually a story about the piece of art. There's usually sentimental value or it, it, it sticks out because it's different. It's, it, to me, it's where the personality comes from. Lovely. Um. <laughs> when it becomes the icing on the cake too is how we look at it. I know we want to talk about incorporating it into this design but sometimes when you put you do this beautiful design then you add that painting or whatever it is into a room of sculpture it's like it all just sort of marries together and sings and it's uh, a great marriage of something that was maybe designed at the same time or created at the same time or something from opposite times so, um, I would ask you um, do you feel that the relationship between artwork and interiors has changed in the present day? If so, how? <laughs> That's your question. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we were talking about this, um, and I, I, I feel like art maybe has be become more incorporated into a design as there are new collectors of art. I think art has become more accessible to people. As an art dealer, that's my job. I have a gallery. I do feel like I still fight with mirrors and <laughs> things over mantles, photographs, as we've talked about. But I, I do, I think there is a change to incorporate art into design and people's homes more than maybe be before. Okay. So now Elizabeth, mm -hmm. how do you think is the best way to introduce a client to an art piece? Hmm. Uh, well, I have a few best ways because I think you really have to take your clue from who you're, well, the proximity of the client and who they are. I have clients who have absolutely no time at all and so I usually start with JPEGs. I actually had, when I first began my business, I started to fill flat files with actual works and I thought this is really gonna be important that people wanna see the work right off the bat and I would bring portfolios to their apartments and I found that um, I really, it doesn't happen that often because 
I'm taking my cues from the interior designers and the interior designers sometimes are, their door's not open for me to have that direct traffic anyway. So it's kind of boiled down to not very romantic at this point, but uh, initially introducing the uh, JPEGs. And so, and then there's a lot of hope that whoever's looking at that JPEG understands it's only that. And then it seems to jump right into if the client can respond and sometimes um, the interior designer will be the sort of eyes of sort of give that fleshing out of this flat, you know, not necessarily very um, tactile representation of this work and say, yes, give their little stamp approval and the artwork comes directly to home, which I think is ultimately in Christine Noses too. I mean, you really, you might see a work of art even in the gallery and it's just, it really either works or doesn't work in the home. It's just a very specific event. So. I push yes. people to try to, t I, we call it on approval and you all should know about it, is that I push people because I know when you see artwork in a gallery that it's a very neutral, white walled space and I can imagine the art in somebody's home or Patrick and Elizabeth can, but sometimes the client just cannot make that leap. They're not used to looking at art like we are. So one of the first things I say is, we're happy to send a truck right over. Oh, you live in Hawaii, who cares? And I have gotten <laughs> myself to Hawaii. I'll have you all know it's quite with things on approval. It's quite a truck. <laughs> so, um, I, so we do, we send things on approval and I think that's really important to try. And you know what, once you get it in there, it's a lot easier for someone to see it and say, yes, I'll take it. Or they'll say, this absolutely does not work. I hate this direction. And it maybe can guide a little better. So. I also think, you know, there's so much is done, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's so much done electronically online. You see things that are, you know, sometimes people are looking at these things for the first time on their phone, not ideal at all. Mm -hmm. But there's so much electronic exposure to these images that you lose the sense of scale. You lose the true color of it. I mean, I think we'd all agree the best way is to see it where it's actually going to end up. But I th where are the interior designers in the in the in the room, either current or future? <laughs> so this is this is your job to get people to understand visualization, to get them to s to see these individual pieces and these things that they're maybe seeing on their phone or their computer, and get them over that hurdle if they can't. If the truck doesn't make it to Hawaii. <laughs> um, we will make it, we will swim it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a really key role of the interior designer. And thank God galleries will do that, you know. Will, and it's the best, it's the best way. It's the best way. way. Yeah, I think that follows right into our presentation slides. So I'm gonna go right ahead and get Okay. Are these mics even working, or do you not care? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. okay. I think you can tell me. Oh. Yeah. So, I, I mean, ideally, if I had if I had my way every single time, I would start with one of two things. I would start with art, or I'd start with a rug. We'll come back for another talk about rugs <laughs> in the future, <laughs> maybe in the winter. Um, but um, I love starting with art. I always have. This is a, a small project that I did for a friend of mine, and the entire, pretty much every decision came from these three pieces. And I brought my cheat sheet because I'm really bad about remembering names of artists. Shoot. Um, yeah, so this is a series. These little pieces. I don't know the, the three little. They're actually oil on copper um, by UK artist Edward Haddon. And this was a, um, is this the right, there we go. So this is one of his pieces. They're all that same size. They're all little landscapes that have sort of this urban edge, but they're very calm. They're very unique palette. And the whole, the whole dis every decision about this room came from that. After the function of the room was addressed, pretty much every decision spun off from these pieces because the art, uh, the, the client loved these pieces. Um, he wanted a guest, a very minimal guest room that was, he was also starting to, to uh, explore Buddhism. So it's one of the reasons why those pieces are so low. Um, I think you can break the rules on how to hang art depending on how the room is used. A lot of the function in this room is either that bed folds out to a guest room, uh, to a guest bed, or he's actually doing meditation on the floor. So the sight line of this piece seems odd when you first walk in, but based on how this room was was used, it made a lot of sense. Can I say something about that too? Yeah. As an art dealer, I absolutely appreciate this, and this is why I appreciate working with you guys, because I would never, if I showed you these works, which I would love and I would go on 
about the artist and what collections they're in and this and that, but I never would have thought to put the works there. <laughs> and that looks amazing to me. <laughs> so I just Thank want to say, I, I think it's a nice marriage between all of us working together. And even besides just the, the necessity that you felt in terms of relating your client mm -hmm. to where he's, the, where he's gonna be and how he's gonna personally appreciate the artwork, I just think the power of scale. Yeah. I mean, it's so amazing where you place the artwork and just the scale in the in the room can be so different and as you say you can really break the rules and it's very compelling it becomes sort of like a, almost a question of why is that that way i mean i think it's really interesting it really puts a lot of depth into the and you the chose three the room. yeah well actually there are two more on another wall okay. so um, and he had this collection i mean that's the other thing if you build a room around a piece of art that a client loves chances are they're going to love the room uh -huh. and y they can't ever s even though all of these decisions a lot of these decisions were sort of made without him he was one of one of the rare carte blanche kind of clients um you know, he walked into that room and he said, this, you know, this room is all about me. And that's kind of what clients want. That's the experience mm -hmm. they kind of want to have. But it was a good uh, bet. So this is, this, these are, you know, we're talking sort of more about fine art, but this was sort of an early lesson. Um, uh, I worked with this uh, couple and a, f a, s a young family and they had collected these, these beaded dolls. And they were sort of scattered around the house and they, s they you know, in the, in the initial tour of what stays, what goes kind of conversation. Um, I, I, I love them, but I thought they were just, they were here and there and half in a drawer and all kinds of things. But I kind of love them and I think it spoke about the family and about the, f the, f the family sense and the sense of travel. And I also love the colors. So they, they also, you can see in the f uh, far upper right, they became sort of the statement installation on the, on the, in the entryway. And then from there on, that determined the wall color, the wall color then determined and what was the accent color in the following room, but it all grew from, from these pieces. And I, I, love, I love doing that. I love working with something that somebody loves to start with. And again, it ends up being very unique to them and a nice statement about who they are. But it also, you know, was, it was a color palette that I wouldn't have necessarily come up with on my own. So um, art is a, an, an incredible resource for color. Um, you know, on the flip side of it, sometimes you were working with a, a far more traditional uh, approach, and this was a, this was a gentleman who had um, museum caliber, like museum caliber art. Um, these are the only ones he would actually let me show, <laughs> because you know he occasionally lends a piece to the Met, you know, as you do. Um, but we 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 did some work in this in this in his uh, home, sort of to highlight the art. And I love art on color. I love art on texture. I think people are sometimes afraid to do that, but, um, and this was obviously a very traditional kind of job, but we, everything sort of came, the decisions came from um, these pieces and his, his collection, his aesthetic, which his, his aesthetic was very clear to me. When you walk in and somebody has an art collection, you don't have to guess what their aesthetic is. You, you can kind of pretty much see it. Patrick, I actually have a question yep. that links right into that. Um, how is the best way to deal when the client already has this um, collection that doesn't really appeal to you, but you want it to, <laughs> you need it to um, integrate into your interior? Well, luckily, I still love what I do. So it has to be pretty horrendous for me to not be find something in it. Right. Um, I think it's, first of all, the most important thing to me is to find out why they love it. Is it sentimental? Is it a piece they bought on their honeymoon? Is it uh, something that was handed down the family? Is it something that reminds them of a trip? To understand why they love it. Right. Um, you know, sometimes the answer could be because it's a Picasso and I want to show it off. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have that problem with clients too, too often, but um, <laughs> I think the key is understanding why they love it. If right. you, if you, and then you sort of build from there. Um, if you, sometimes it's a matter of it's just not presented properly. Sometimes I can grow to love something because it's frame, you know, we go back and we, f we reframe it. I had a couple who um, collects these beautiful Ukrainian black and white art prints, and they had four of them. Two were unframed and two were framed, but they were framed very badly, like tiny little plastic frames, and, and they looked like somebody had ripped pages out of a calendar and framed them. And by the time we got done, and they were important pieces of art. They were contemporary Ukrainian artists, woodcut, and it was very, very unique to this family beautiful pieces, by the time we reframed them, I wish I had a before and after of that because it, it made a world of difference. So sometimes it's a matter of presentation that you just, <laughs> and then if you still don't love it, you're like, oh, it's, it would look great in the media room. Like, <laughs>
<laughs> put, it, I, put it there. I've worked with a client who had a major interior designer. They did a beautiful house in the Hamptons, and they didn't want to use the designer to pick the art out, and I or work with them anyway, and I thought it was a huge mistake. And I sold them a lot of art, I admit, but I didn't see the house, the design, I didn't see any. So they would come in and I'd prance paintings out and they bought a lot. <laughs> and I went for the installation and I have to say, I, they bought beautiful things, but it didn't quite coincide with what the design of their house was. And I thought it was sort of a shame because I think we all could have worked together and gotten everything to mix, but it, now it's a little off the mark, and we were hanging things that were, you know, over panel wood panels that were just too large. And I know you don't buy art for that, and I know we don't want to talk about it like that, but we could have found something. So I do think it's, you know, it's, it's. I think it's good if you can approach the subject too, so it's not too. And if the client wants to do it themselves, I don't see why you can't be sort of advisory on it as well. So. <laughs> Um, this was, I, I, I'm a huge fan of bringing s um, contemporary art into an otherwise traditional space. And this isn't a, tr you know, terribly traditional space, but it was sort of the best, best example. I love, I love that idea of, I think it can sort of, I always say it shakes the dust, dust off traditional um, design to have a contemporary piece of art in an otherwise traditional room. But this, this speaks to sort of the, I had to, um, coerce is not quite the right word, but convince is a much more a better word. Um, this client actually had gone through an incredible personal journey that involved health, and then she decided to invest in her home, and it, she went on a very personal journey. Um, she had made some decisions in her home, but I, I, I got her to uh, consider this contemporary photograph by, <laughs> get back to that in a second. Um, did I write them down? Anyhow. Um, you can, I'll put it on my blog, you can go to my <laughs> blog and find out who it is. Um, but I loved it because actually it was a, it's a Luna moth and I thought in a bedroom to see that before you go off to sleep is like, you know, bef this was before the Lunesta commercials even, but um, <laughs> she thought of it as a butterfly and I didn't correct her because she loved it because of the idea of this reemergence as a butterfly. So sometimes, sometimes you tweak the story so they get on board. <laughs> it was probably, it was the most she ever spent on art and it, it ended up being one of her favorite things in the whole, in the whole place. Um, so when I don't get to do it for my clients, I do it at home. So this is, I collect uh, portraits. This is a Christopher Makos uh, photograph. One of my, one of my uh, tricks and tips for, for buying art on a, sort of on a little bit of a budget, because Christopher's work is, he's, he's very well known for doing um, portraits of Andy, Andy Warhol and drag. That's his, you've, you've, I'm sure you've probably seen them. But he also does other, other things, and sometimes if you like a photographer, you like an artist, but you find a piece that's not necessarily what they're famous for, you can add a piece if it speaks to you, and these, this piece actually spoke to me, but it, I have a, a, a Herb Ritz print too that is not sort of an iconic image of his, which then made it affordable, which is why I have it in my home, because I would not be able to have an iconic Herb Ritz in my home, more than that not the case. Um, but again, a lot of these, just, you know, like it's in, in my own home, it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. Which came first, the art or the interior style? It was sort of emerged at the same time, but uh, you know, I, I think one informs the other a little bit. So this was, this is, oh my God, uh, Charles Schmaltz. That's a photograph of a welder's mask that's in the in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and again, if I can't get clients to do it, I will do it in, in any opportunity I have. This is a, a, a Bloomingdale's window. Um, it was a contest. And I started, the first thing I just, uh, the first decision I made was to use these portraits. These are um, old portraits, damaged portraits, the unloved portraits on eBay. It's very sad. Um, <laughs> because of condition, because nobody knew the provenance, because of they were split up as a pair, I was able to s sort of acquire these over time. And this, that was the first decision when I knew I had this gig to do this window. The first thought I had was, I want to use these portraits. So, and then things things happen after that. Old men are hard to sell. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, but again. Like I said, I like traditional uh, contemporary art and traditional interiors. I like the other. I like th the other way around too. I think the di the tension is really interesting. Um, I do, uh, uh, as mentioned, I do uh, design on a dime every year. There's one coming up April 24th in 21 days. Um, and the first year I did it again, I started with art. I started the first piece I, I built around was this piece, the back piece um, by Babette Hirschberger. 
she's a very good friend, but it's a mouthful to say. And um, she's a wonderful colorist, and um, she has these interesting pieces that are that hold their own from a, a, a distance, but also have very intricate surfaces, so they're very engaging up close, which was perfect for this event. But. Um, and you know, who doesn't build a room around a three foot you know, green, lime green parakeet? This was also design a dime, which is, you know, these rooms are so full of things because everything is sold out of the booth. So it's a, a little bit more merchandise than my typical uh, interiors are, but only actually only just a little bit. But, I, have um, I have a question. Yeah? Um, uh, how do you decide where to place them? I can see this there, here there's a variety of um, heights and how do you uh, mentalize and um, apply into the interior, you know, beforehand? Do you put tapes, do you, do you see those uh, DIY things? To just imagine the look of the interior or you already know what, uh, what you're going to do with that? You know, when I knew, the, the, first, the, the first two decisions for this year, for this year was the parakeet and the wallpaper. Um, and I, from the moment I knew I was going to do both, I could picture that view. Like even before I had the sofa, I, I could I just pictured that view. And then it was a matter of just soliciting donations to to make okay. that view happen. But um, on this one, you know, there's a short wall, there's a long wall. There's this was a corner. This booth was a corner that year. So you know, it's like you do in a house. You imagine the sight lines. How where are you seeing this? Is it the end of a hallway that needs to you know sort of draw you down a hallway? Is it something you're you're going to pass through the through the the length of a space so you're close to it? So. Where it goes, I would say, determines like whether it should be a collect, a, a, a grouping, or a yeah. big piece, or sometimes the more you do it too, I think the more you see where your vistas are. It's kind of like really anything you do. I mean, in the gallery, it's funny because we're always like 58 to 62, and you know, we <laughs> that's what we do. So that's why it's interesting to me. And uh, you know, of course, immediately I'm like, oh, you know, make sure when you sit on the sofa, your head's not going <laughs> to bang into your Picasso <laughs> behind you. You know, those basic things. But you know, it's a showroom. <laughs> You're selling it, but yeah. You know what, I, I have, I've been just thinking, I've done this for so long, and I think that I have a plan when I bring the artwork in, particularly when it's a, a salon, if it's a, you know, assemblage, never works. I have to like <laughs> yes. put it in the room, move it, and just like one inch, if I, you know, the paintings are too far apart, they start to like, I, they say lose their relationship, and it's really about finding that sort of, the rhythm in the room, and I cannot figure out a formula for it. I can't pre, I, I sort of have some ideas, yeah. but other, they, the paintings like to be where they are, and sometimes they, it's like just not quite right, and you just have to completely switch them around. I mean, it just, it, I don't know how what we hang a show in the gallery. I feel like you think you're going to put something here that's your lead piece, and that's where you, but you know, you get into a space, and maybe you move something over, or you think you're going to double hang things this way, but then you end up going this way. I think you have to be open to it. You have to be comfortable enough, and if your client likes the work, they want to include it in the design, or you're going to make it look right. You're going to make it look right. That's your job. You, you make it, and I think you get more comfortable with that and maybe at first you start with one thing or you don't do a salon style but you get it becomes familiar to hang things in a grouping I think and that's maybe that's a little bit why um, you know why at least I felt it was important to really have this topic and you know my colleagues certainly as well is it, it's kind of a little bit it's harder in a way to deal with art because of those reasons because art sort of has it's ways it needs to be in the room. And art brings the story into the room. It brings a lot. And I could see, and what has happened to me and why I'm hoping <laughs> with a lot of the new interior designers that are in this room right now, and this, the very topic that we're talking about, start with art, is if it could be something that is really considered at the inception of your design. Because at the very end, it's, people are tired, and it, it just, it's the challenge, first of all, of getting your client to resurrect that enthusiasm for finishing the job, but now you've got to go get this big emotional pull, because they really have to respond to it, and, and the nice thing about the way, the level of where we work, when we're working, when I'm working with clients of interior designers, and people with means, they still, if they, if they aren't already collectors or it's their second home, th essentially they're buying what they love. They're not buying to build their financial portfolio. They're not buying to impress anybody. They're really going to have, um, you know, it's going to have to mean something to them, which feels 
very meaningful to me as, as the person that's generating the sale and to all of us. But, but I think if that can be a consideration as part of the total equation, it maybe won't be such an onerous task because you have to invest so much, I feel. And that's maybe why you have to start from the beginning because budget-wise, it is, you know, art can cost money. So if you're throwing it in at the end, everyone's gonna be like, oh my God, we've already spent, <laughs> I gotta get something for, you know, $500 that's, you know, this big and it can't be done well. So maybe you start thinking about early and get them on board early and start looking early because I do think it takes time to find, if someone is not a seasoned collector, it, you gotta look at a lot of stuff before yeah. they're gonna get comfortable. And you need to look at a lot. Just yeah. keep looking so you get comfortable with but it. But you know, we were having this, we kind of rehearsed a few of these questions, <laughs> although now we are off and running. But I have to say, <laughs> I think the idea of the budget diminishing is really, it's just sort of, I don't think, I don't buy that. I think it's just someone's really tired. They've been, you know, through this renovation process or con construction process for a whole year and a half and they just don't want to take the time. Because uh, that's Maybe, the big Or they don't, or the clients aren't into it. I mean, some yeah. people are not interested. Well, that's not, true Some too. people are just not interested. I remember saying to my old art dealer boss, I said once, I'm going somewhere with a bunch of rich people. I'm going to sell them a lot of art. And he goes, just because they're rich doesn't mean they like art. And I was like, oh. <laughs> but it does. I mean, like, oh, right. Like, we all love art and we would have collections if we could, but not everybody feels that way. So I do, like, that is the dream day when everybody comes in and we're all on board, but it, most days don't, don't seem like that necessarily. I don't know, for me. Um, I'll give you, this is a sneak peek of this year's Design in a Dime. This is a piece by Dan Romer, uh, a phenomenally talented guy. And again, every decision pretty much came that followed came from this. There's that crown that he's wearing. There's that, you know, that crazy clay pink. There's this pink and yellow. There's this strong element of black. There's a fine line. There's gutsy line and everything. So you have to come on April 24th to see the final product. But this is a sneak peek and um, framed by Lowy Framers. We have my friend Rebecca in the audience. So um, I'm excited to see him come to life. But it, it again, left to my own devices, this is where I would start a room. Oops. Oops. Is it repeating? <laughs> Is that it? You're going back, are you? Is it the top button? If you're having technical <laughs> problems, this is scary. Please stand by. I won't have a clue. It's the bigger button. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, Holiday House also started, the first The first uh, person I invited to the, to the Holiday House was that gentleman over the fireplace. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Martin Scholler photograph. And again, Martin Scholler is very well known for his presidential portraits of President Obama, of Hollywood movie stars. Um, they're generally giant. They're usually this format. They're, they're, they're sort of beautiful and unforgiving at the same time. But this was a piece of, you know, not a celebrity, not of a politician. So it was something that I was able to add to my collection. But I knew I was doing St. Patrick's Day because Holiday House Every Room sort of is supposed to be inspired by a holiday. I thought, well, he's got greenish eyes and red hair. He <laughs> looks Irish <laughs> enough. He's coming with me to the room. But the funny thing is when I bought this piece, because I, I own this piece, um, he's never, he'd never been up on a wall before. He lives under my bed. But um, uh, I always pictured it, hi, I, him, I refer to it as a him, um, in a very pale, very contemporary, very modern environment where he was sort of the only do dash of color. You know, I, because it's a very interesting, and in, and in real life, it's it's very colorful in a very quiet way. And I always pictured it that way, but when I thought I was doing St. Patrick's Day and I knew I wanted to do sort of a jewel box kind of emerald room, I thought, that would be really interesting to see him in that kind of a room. Um, and again, I love that mix, and it, I wanted the room to feel sort of like there was some history to it, but that someone younger had taken it over and started to in, impose his own aesthetic into it. So that was the first the first decision. And then I knew that, well, white has to be a design feature, so that led to other other choices. So um, You have to also um, keep in mind, there we go, there's the color of the room, a little closer, it's yep. this vivid green. Yeah. That's beautiful. Amazing. Yes. This grass cloth? Uh, it was grass cloth, yep. Like yeah. a, the what's it called, herringbone? Uh, yeah, like a, 
like a piece grass cloth kind of Escherish. It was my version of a Celtic knot. It all, I ran everything through my own filter of what I thought Irish, Irish, Irish design should be. <laughs> Luckily, some actual Irish people came in and gave me the thumbs up. But um, <laughs> I tried to bring a little bit of Dublin to the Upper East Side, but again, through my own filter, because this was, you know, I wanted the work to also represent what I love to do, which is a mix of, interior, of contemporary and traditional and things like that. So, um, and then on the other pieces, the top again is a Dan Romer piece, the bottom is a, a Jefferson Heyman piece, and um, a, a, I just loved it, so it's sometimes it's a matter of ju finding justification for something you love in the room, and I think clients do that too, and I think interior designers help clients do that, you know, sort of celebrating a piece, but um, the skull was my nod to the idea of the whole reliquaries of, of, of churches where they keep saints' bones, so a little bit of a stretch, but I, I got to use Dan's piece in the, uh, Jefferson's piece in the, in the, in the room. And then the, f the final big piece, and this, this sort of was, you know, it was a tiny room, it was only nine, nine and a half by nine and a half. Um, this is on the opposite wall from the fireplace. And you know, this, this piece, to your earlier point about like it hangs sort of over the chair rail and it's bigger than the room. But, <laughs> but it gave the room, it f almost felt like a window and it gave the room a sense of architecture and it also balanced that fireplace. So I think balance is one of the yeah. things. And I, I, I think going to galleries, and going to museum shows to see how work is installed, in, you know, one giant piece on one wall and one tiny, vividly colored piece opposite it. Why did they do that? What, what is that? What, what is that? I, I love getting ideas from how gallery shows are hung. I sold once a Georgia O'Keeffe painting that was this big and everyone, a lot of people passed on it because they were like, it's too small, it's too small. And I was like, that painting can hold a wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how stunning is that to have this little beautiful pink Georgia O'Keeffe on a huge wall? And that, mm. so, I mean, you know, you just have to think outside the box. Oh, yeah. You know what? That's true. I mean, there, yeah. there are, once again, there are big paintings that are small. I mean, they just, <laughs> yeah. you put them on the wall and they're like, they are expansive and you just can't tell them. Sometimes you cannot work with dimensions when you have a need and you're trying to explain to your client, well, you know, yes, I thought we needed a 68 by 45 inch painting, but really, I mean, well, just. That's the thing about art. I think we have the stereotype of over the sofa and you need this size, and that is true many times, but you know, that's a powerful work of art that sings to you or to your client may be something out of the box that you wouldn't expect. Um, and, and I also specifically love the combination of this antique chest, this beautiful mm -hmm. antique chest, and this very clean contemporary. Again, it gave me another window into that room. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it almost, it, you know, it almost read like a color block painting to me that sort of held its own against this dark wall, but also against this pretty massive piece of furniture beneath it. Um, I wanted to sort of give you, this is a room obviously without art. This, not all, I, newsflash, not all client projects end well. The case, <laughs> <laughs> just, sorry, sorry to be the first, first, your first of all. <laughs> um, but we got to this point where we had pretty much finished the room except for the accessories. Now a lot of the decisions for this project had been made by the woman's collection. She had some Asian pieces. She had some uh, specific paintings that we were, she was combining two apartments, so it was all sort of a free-for-all of recombining things. Um, we didn't get to the point of hanging the art, and I wanted to sort of show, like, you know, a lot of people would think, except for, you know, maybe some things on the dresser, this project is finished, but, um, you know, this is the piece that I wanted to hang over the fire, over the fireplace, over the bed, um, you know, or these flanking the bed, uh -huh. something that would like give it to, yeah. and this is another room. Now this room, a lot of decisions came specifically from her collections that she then wouldn't let me put back into the room, but anyhow. Um, but, so this is the piece that I had proposed, you know, a contemporary piece different th in, in the flavor of what she had collected, but different, so it wasn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I don't like rooms that look like theme restaurants. Um, so th this spoke to the room, it worked a lot of the colors together. Um, so this is, oh, I don't have the after. Oh, you'll have to just imagine what oh, that we didn't looks look like <laughs> in that. <laughs> no, I didn't. But you did not I, no, get no. No, this is this is this well is where I left the left, left the project. But um, yeah. so sometimes seeing the room, a lot of a lot of times clients will say, "Oh, the room is finished," and they say, "Just bear with me. Let Christine deliver the painting. Let's put it up." If, if yeah. you can get that to happen, it, it really, really works. So. It is the icing on the cake. I mean, that room would have a whole different life to it. <laughs> yeah. I know. That's the thing too. Really? I mean, if you can get the the artwork in the room, it's more. There's a greater chance that it's not going to go back. It's not always the case, but if you can at least get the clients to say yes, 
Um, I think that's and very compelling. And you can compelling. do it privately too, you know, send it in when they're not there maybe. Like, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. maybe if you're not confident, I don't know, and just see if it works for you. If you're at that phase where you, you're not really confident about it or try two things, you know, we don't just necessarily, I mean, sometimes you, you nail it and then other times you bring several things. It, it's like anything you're doing, just think of it the same, same way. And Christine, is there any room that you wouldn't place art? Uh, a room that you wouldn't do it. <laughs> Put a picture of it. Bathrooms would be Concerts tricky. And bathrooms. I've seen it all. I mean, I, you know, of course, I have a museum background, so there are rooms that I would say I have questions about, like a sunroom maybe with so much pounding light. Maybe right. you wouldn't want to work on paper if you want to go there. But, you know, I would sell anyone. I just think it's an interesting question for you guys to think about. There are people who love art and they want it all over practically on their ceilings. And there's other people you have to sort of force it down their throats. So, no, I say put it wherever people want it and I'm happy to sell it to you. <laughs> what about you guys, though? Do you feel like you... I mean, other than, like, light and moisture issues, I think everything's fair game. I love I love art in bathrooms. If, it, yeah. if it's a piece that's not going to be affected by... Or if a, a powder room or you know if it's a I, why not have we spend a lot of time in the bathroom so right. like there should be you know why not have <laughs> a great design piece of art. to a bathroom I have put works on paper in a bathroom with tubs and I you know I try to say up front you know humidity can affect you know and there, these are little things you need to know but people have still made they love it so much they want it in there you know so they can sit in the bathtub and look at it okay and generally these are larger powder rooms, bathrooms, than you know, <laughs> a little New York style. So. I just want to go back to delivering the artwork to the clients on approval. I've worked with a designer where the clients, this was their pied -a terre and so they weren't there, and I, we tried, the designer had me leave the artwork, also the clients, I don't know, somehow we weren't going to be talking. I, you know, the art advisor wasn't going to be able to have that dialogue. So we brought the artwork in and just left it, and it was leaning against the wall, and the people would come in on the weekend and they would go home. And of course they didn't buy the artwork, because it's just sitting there, <laughs> and you know, you need, somebody needs to know the story. It's really important. It, it, this is go, comes back to it's a little bit of work, but you really need to let the people know, you know, what is important about this work. Why should I like this? What and and even even just sitting on the floor, it's you know how important things are. The difference between sitting on the floor and on the wall, and you need someone to at least hold it up. So there just needs to be more interaction. I have just found. I have not been successful when there's no interaction. Either the interior design right. is going to be there or or your art advisor or somebody's going to be there to to make that connection for that person so they have a chance to have it sort of gestate. Or instead of having it lean up against the wall, it should be hung where it should, it should be lit the way it is. It should be styled the way the interior design. I mean, I mean sometimes that is enough to, to get them over the hurdle. If it comes in, it looks beautiful, and it's also there. Sometimes they're like, well, I don't want to go through the hassle of returning it. Like, sometimes that, yes. that helps. <laughs> sometimes whatever that factors, works. Sometimes that factors into it. I do whatever, <laughs> whatever, 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 whatever So this is um, the Holiday House, the room adjacent. I worked with an interior designer, James Rixner, and um, James is fairly, um, Say. He's pretty specific. He's been around for a long time. This was actually a new palette for him, but it's very quiet, it's very elegant, and so I had to really think about his sensibility um, when I was providing the artwork. But I will say, um, this is kind of the dream come true for an interior designer. When you're working in a show house, you put together your dream team and you don't have to deal with a client. So it's exactly what you want, and everybody sort of secretly goes, this is the best it gets, you know? <laughs> so if we, could, if we could find a way to make money doing this. Yes, right. we awesome. really would. So these were works on paper, and the, actually the work, the, um, the larger work by an artist named um, Marianne Strandell that was actually kind of a pun on the, the design, design itself. It is a... Um, it's a house in LA. It's one of the case study houses by um, Pierre Koenig. And then overlaying on that uh, is chinoiserie and various other um, sort of um, design motifs. So it's sort of, we thought that would sort of play along with this whole sense of design and, um, and also that it's modern as opposed to this, which is, well, it's kind of a mix. Actually, the room's really a mix. 
and then two works on paper that are more of a modernist feel, but they're by a contemporary artist. And um, the, the larger piece was actually supposed to be on an easel in a corner of the room, and it was obviously not going to work on the easel when it was arrived, you know, it was delivered, it was like, oh my God, that's huge, and we had something else that's destined for that, that, pe that uh, particular area, and James thought about switching it, and it just was perfect, and everybody throughout the whole show house then was commenting and really admiring and responding to that work, so that was his judgment, really, his call, that once again, I mean, that was where that, play, that piece rightfully needed to be, and it was commanding in, in that particular area, and wouldn't have worked somewhere else. So just push the big button? Yeah. Okay. All right, so this was actually, um, James selected this. I took him to an artist studio. This is Michael Filan, and it's actually one of his quieter pieces. There, um, but this was selected. I hadn't even seen the room, but James knew what his his palette was going to be, so immediately decided that's what's going to be over the mantelpiece. So that was going to be a significant piece and really reflective of his design concept. And okay, so this is an example of. Uh, an interior designer um, with whom I've worked many times and she designed this salon hanging. This is what she wanted and she knew precisely the dimensions, the outside dimensions of the rectangle. She knew basically the scale of each piece that she wanted. So I had to find the right scale <laughs> and the right work. And um, we got some really amazing pieces and the client this is their, her pied -a this client, this is a, um, a, a small apartment in, uh, on the Upper West Side. She lives in Los Angeles, and what usually never works is Magdalena Keck, who was the interior designer that I worked with, put this whole um, piece together in a kind of a virtual way and showed the client, and the client went yes to everything. So all of a sudden, boom, we bought everything. And so um, basically the two small pieces on the lower right are um, works by Sidney Geist. He's, this is from an estate. He was um, a very prominent sort of post-modernist artist, not really a household name, but in the art world sort of respected. And then um, Roy Dowell in the upper left-hand corner, who's actually has in a show right now at Lennon Weinberg Gallery, and he's really incredible, I've loved See, I actually, for what's great for me is I have these favorites. I'll just fall in love with an artist or a work of art, and I'll just keep hammering and hammering until I find the right client and the right place that really responds to that. And then it feels so gratifying. You know? so, and I really found that here. And then two in the center, up first row, is Larry Webb, um, a contemporary artist whose work I've sold quite a bit. And I just adore his work. It was just really wonderful and then um, I won't go through the whole thing actually but it just she her design went along with the artwork so this was one of those start with art concepts and actually I forgot to tell you that the whole thing was a package for it so the the client got to see the artwork got to see the color of the walls got to see the furniture and everything it just went boom yes I you know thumbs up on but that you reframed all the I mean they had you re somebody reframed. They yes. were not all framed in white and in oh, different types of good frames. Point. Yes, we spent a lot of time at the framers with it has yeah. to be this deep, it has to be this wide. I mean, yeah, that's she's a choice. Really meticulous. Yeah. And I it mean, works. It's beautiful. And because I think sometimes clients can't. You make it so perfect here that mm -hmm. client. some of those would have old 70s brass frames around them. Like, you really have to help. I don't know if you did something on the Photoshop or whatever, but I mean, sometimes you have to help out in that way for people who can't visualize. Yeah. That's no, great. That's absolutely that's right. Beautiful. I forgot that there was, yeah. yes, Meg was very, very, very yeah. involved, but it's perfect. It's beautiful. I it love is. It. But also when she, you said she showed the whole package, I mean, context is so important. Yeah. Like where is this piece going? What's it above? What's it relating to? You know, th there's that adage, you know, the, the art shouldn't match the sofa. You know, that's sort of that old saying. But I have no problem matching the sofa or the art. Like, I don't have any issue with that. But, mm -hmm. I, but I think that's also where some of the life of the room comes from. But yeah. context is huge. You yeah. know, sending them a JPEG of that, of any one of those, and not put it in the, the realm of that collection and that hanging style. I, wouldn't have, I don't think she would have signed off on the whole thing. Right. But she could have had the furnishings all together and then, yeah. I mean, that's generally the way it works. And, and 
Um, I, I don't know whether it was more successful to, to pack. I think that, that in this case, the interior designer had complete trust. I mean, the, the client had complete trust in the interior mm -hmm. designer, and that's, we were talking about that earlier today, too. I mean, th that whole relationship is so key, and it's so, it's so challenging. This is what's so challenging um, for all of you, is that you have to manufacture these really quick um, and close uh, friendships in a way, or not? No, it's not a friendship, but it's an understanding. Partnership, and it has to go under the skin. It has to. You, it's it's really like a. a it's a. Yes. What were you saying? Psychological. Yeah, you sort of. You know, you have to analyze your client when you meet someone. You figure out. You get an understanding, and you either jive or you don't jive. That's how you get the job, really, ultimately, and that's how we sell paintings. And you have to figure out. And you know, some people, some clients will become your friends. Other people, you will be like, adios. You know, and that, you know, that's how we. <laughs> but there's still then, even if you yeah. have that adios feeling, you still have to there's have respect or something or, going yeah. on that that allows you to be successful and to find out what they like too, which is. Also, I mean, reaching into, with the artwork, it's also, well, I'm called upon by the interior designers and, and I am your client. I'm the one that makes you look good, hopefully. I, I help fulfill your needs. But I'm taking cues from you as far as what your client likes. And so sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. But es essentially, someone's got to get into the head and the heart. And oftentimes, the client doesn't know themselves. So it just takes so much patience. It's very com it's complex. I had a client who, won who told me very early on, you know, sometimes people know what they hate before they know what they like. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I hate red. Don't show me red. Like, I don't want red. And we ended up going to the Affordable Art Fair, which is one of my favorite. It's right. actually right now. It's going on right now. It's a great show. Uh, affordable is a relative term, but um, uh, it's a great show. And s I took him there because we were sort of sourcing for, and I don't do this all the time, but we're friends. And so, and he, he turned a corner and he saw this piece by Jordan Eagles who makes artwork out of cow blood sounds hideous they are gorgeous and it's red like it's blood red it's red he's like i love it i'm like well, there goes that rule like <laughs> like okay you know what else do you hate right. I mean, I know. you know that's the, that's good that's it's good just Never take those words at face I've value that happened numerous times numerous times yeah. i think you just have to and i think contest or it, you know art sings to you so yeah. it's just whatever however you can get that song to happen so this is another Magdalena success story with the same apartment. So we did another salon hanging. Once again, you know, um, just this very thoughtful approach to what was going to be in the um, arrangement and how they were going to be placed, juxtaposed with each other on the wall. And um, I, I mean, just perfectly balanced and very, really fascinating artists, each one. None of them particularly well known. Um, but all of them meriting note, which was, which is also a really terrific, another great thing about interior designers is that you really can, there is so much talent out there and not um, all, n not so easy to see because there are, there are fewer galleries and there are, have to be different ways to get art into the public and to have people appreciate it. And, and I think interior designers, interior designers really provide that um, new and extended opportunity for the art world. And so, and I was really, really, really happy with what was decided upon. Okay, uh, ooh, sorry, overexposed. Um, <laughs> this is actually back with James Rixner. It's a staged uh, penthouse in a condominium um, complex called Azure up on the Upper East Side. Uh, and this, um, the, I can't really call it a painting. It's, it's gold and silver and um, metal leaf uh, work on canvas. And it just, I knew that James was going to love it. I just knew it. It was for the bedroom. And there was all of a sudden going to be this quick walkthrough way before the whole place was completed in the staging. And the dining room was the only place that was completed. So we put the, uh, the painting up. This, over this fake mantle as a you know a quick fix and it just that was where it needed to stay <laughs> even though it was wider than the mantle it shouldn't have worked but it worked perfectly it really was the right the right place for the right room and vice versa it really made the room sing 
Okay, and this is um, a work by Liz Marcus, who is, I'm, I'm just, I don't know why I'm so in love with her work, but it's, it just, I mean, sometimes you just have that feeling that you just, I don't know, indescribably fascinated. So her work is actually um, very complex because she composes these overlays of very, very thin veils of color. And they either work or they don't. You, you know, either successful in those overlays or it gets muddy and awful. And there's a, a small collage element that was sort of the key to the painting. It's, it's, that's a picture of a, a Robert Rauschenberg painting in um, the Albright Knox Museum. And the painting is called Albright Knox. <laughs> and then, so this is her sort of response to that picture. And um, James, this is a James Rixer, same staged apartment, and he just loved it. And that's just the other thing, you know, I just, you, you never know how the re designer's gonna respond, and he just thought it was great, and it worked perfectly. The, the, the idea of, of this was, you know, it's a fairly, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna say, the, for, for my ignorance of vocabulary, but I just think it's sort of Ralph lauren -y type, it's just sort of very sort of staid, and and elegant, and I really wanted to kind of mix things up. So to put the Liz Marcus in there for me was the right thing, and I was really glad that I got the approval, and I think it really, it makes the room much more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like, I like those as acidic notes in, in a room that is otherwise sort of all one way to give it, you know, if I love sweets, but if you need, sometimes you need something a little sour or a little uh -huh. salty to balance it, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so this is another, ah, it's so, I'm sorry, this was my photograph, doesn't work, but um, just quickly, this, this was a hallway, and this color on the wall, James isn't in this room, I can say, it's one of the ugliest colors I've ever seen, it was a dark, dark gray, and I just, I don't know, it seemed to work, every, but it didn't work for me, and I kept trying to put colorful artwork up, and it just, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't work. So I decided, okay, it's gotta be black and white. And then I thought, well, it's just a hallway and it needs the pattern of a salon hanging. It needs the pattern of some uh, kind of odd juxtaposed work hung together. So um, I'm sorry that you can't see it in the context, but it's that's because it's just so small. But um, I felt like that, it really was successful. I thought it looked very good and solved my problem. Um, this is a, a, a staging called at the Printing House West Village. This was with Carrier and Company. And in this case, I worked with Carrier and Company. We selected artwork and I just, I never saw the room. It just all came together. Jesse Carrier and I sat down and he sort of showed me some ideas of colors, but basically he went through and said yes, yes, yes. And so made some really great decisions um, and I think they just really worked fabulously in the room. And actually, um, this condo sold before it even opened. There was a, an, a preview, and so, I mean, I don't really know if it was our <laughs> uh, definitely our helped. staging that did it. And we can take the <laughs> but it was, of course it was. Okay. <laughs> yes, it certainly was. But, but I do think that the power of staging is another thing that really gives people the vision, and it just, it, um, so I have a question for you. Do you also have that type of service where people, they want to sell their apartment and they want to stage the apartment? Do they come to you or that doesn't work like that? Um, they can and they, they should can. come. Yes, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Anyway, we've, I've, I've been working more on prospective like model apartments at this point. Right. Although this was kind of a model, but it was for sale. So it sort of bridged both of those categories. But I do feel that that's, I mean, I guess it's on, you know, there's plenty of examples of that. Television tells you that, that it really, if, if somebody can walk into a place and, and have a sense of how it's livable, that really helps finish and the deal. consider, I mean, the gallery or artists that you know, your vendors, we, we loan these works. Sometimes they sell in a fantasy land. Sometimes we loan to show houses like everybody else and it comes back to us. But it's, it does expose people, a lot of people to an artist. So it's, you know, so you have to look also where you're going to get the art and, you know, where you source it. Too, so we the Jefferson Heyman in my room sold. Actually. Yeah, I mean it. It, mm. it happened. We <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Not always. But you know what? I actually a client that I have now um, did not at all. I started my typical way of showing 
introducing clients because I could sit down with him directly. The interior designer was not there. I was given license. And so I, I typically sit with my computer and start just going through images, um, just almost like a Rorschach, just to see what he responds to. And he just started to like, you know, <laughs> look the other way. And he just finds I, I don't even relate to this. Mm -hmm. So I, I realize, okay, I've got a problem. And then I decide, well, I'll take him to the Azure staging where there was a fair, fairly broad um, range of artwork. And as it turned out, he fell in love with much of the work we ended up taking to his house and it sold. It went into his house and that was it. So um, I, I, there's so much benefit to just having the work actually in a context. It's great to have it on the walls in a gallery, but it's also great to just see yeah, it in a, in a space. So this was also the printing house, and this was a Mike Filan, the same artist who I told you, whose work was in the um, holiday house over the mantle. So this is more what he's up to, which are really these florid, rich pop colors, and they're, they're just so fun and vibrant, and I just, that's what this room really needed. I was so glad, once again, Jesse Carrier to the rescue. Made some really inter interesting decisions. And then we have Christine mm -hmm. Berry. What time is it? Do we have time? Yes. Go ahead, Christine, of course. I'm going to be quick about this because I can't <laughs> talk about design, really. But there's my partner. She will kill me. I just snapped that photo. That's outside the gallery. That's our current show. Come visit sometime. So I just wanted to show you some pictures of an exhibition, Edward Avedisian, who these are all from the early 60s. My job is really to help impart information to you. So I'm not going to rattle on about the artist, but I really, and you can ask these guys, I, give, I, I will give you my spiel, but I will give you talking points. You can either have me talk to your client, and I can do this this, the Vanna White, or I can give you points and you can do it. I'm happy either way, however, whomever the designer is feels comfortable. Maybe you know a particular artist better than I do, so you may be better at presenting it. Um, we have a stable of artists that we work with at the gallery, so I can also, if you're looking at certain things, I can say, well, I can get more from the artist or the estate. So this is, you know, white walls, cement floors, Chelsea. Um, <laughs> these look beautiful in interiors. They're strong, um, but they look great on the white walls too. But so I, I chose this specific, it's a Frank Wimberly painting. I love Frank Wimberly, you know Frank Wimberly. White, eh, it looks okay, right? So I, often we're dealing with JPEGs and it's a problem. It is a problem and that's why I beg, please come in and look. But sometimes you guys don't have time, I don't have time, you call me and say I need something, da 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 and I have to send you JPEGs. And it's frightening, but we have to do it. This is Charles Pavarini the mm. third, um, beautiful white. And look, you know, we all know a, a white painting can be beautiful. This has beautiful texture. Um, but you see how a J, like just seeing the dimension in the room makes such a difference compared to what that painting looked like. Here's a Dan Christensen. It's a terrible JPEG. Sometimes we don't have good JPEGs. Like if the artist doesn't have a good JPEG or we haven't had the photographer come yet, so we have these horrible JPEGs. <laughs> Somehow we have to get beyond it. Jamie Drake, you know, Dan Christensen. So I can tell you, you know, we deal with a lot of artists that have museum collections, provenance. That's sort of what Elizabeth, you know, you have to decide how much you want to learn or know about an artist and how far you're going to take it. And you will get familiar with certain artists and you'll go back. It's like anything you do. You might like a certain time period. You might like a certain artist and you're going to keep going back to that artist style and then you can speak to it better. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. If you want to get a master class on using contemporary art in interiors, look at the work of Jamie Drake. I'm sure you're all familiar, but he, he, I learned from him and what he, how he uses art in rooms it's and how it relates or doesn't relate to the color of the room. He, he's, he he, I think he's a master. Amazing. And he loves Dan Christensen and he keeps coming back to Dan Christensen and of course you do that. So again, here's another Dan Christensen. This was at the Lee Jofa um, show room over at the D&D building. So just to show like you can use art in a room that is crazy, a lot going on, and then put a crazy bright painting, and sometimes you keep it simple. You just, you know, it's it's up to you guys how you use it. It's just funny in a gallery how I don't see it like this. I don't <laughs> see it. I see the white walls, and I'm going on about 1965 views <laughs> and the response of I at MoMA and blah, blah, blah. And so it's, this is fun for me to talk about it like this. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm okay with it. <laughs> I'm okay with it. So, but you do find people you want to work with. You know, art, there is a no 
notion that snob snobbery and this and that. And I think you guys have that too on some level. But I think you find people you want to work with. Don't we always yeah. find people we want to yeah. work with in whatever you do? So um, this is Gershon Benjamin, James Dougherty. So just over the top. This is selling fabrics, people. <laughs> this is Susan Vexy, another artist we work with. We sell her work all the time. She is a Long Island painter. These are Long Island scenes. This was a Hampton show house, Mabley Handler. Um, and Susan, we can't keep her work. We're having a show of her work, the reasonably priced. So, you know, her work is, it's subtle. It fits into the room. People have a connection to place. That's one of my tips for you. If you know people have a home in Maine or vacation in Maine or have a place in the Hamptons, they might want to have a work of an artist that is from that place or, you know, a seascape or, you know, this is obvious stuff, but people do, that's a good, easy way to make a connection. Mm. I, I picked this because this painting we got it in, um, it, William Parahudoff, color field artist. These are from the 80s. He's known for his 60s work. So again, it's like what Patrick's talking about. You, These works cost half the price that a work from the 60s would cost. And they're fabulous. Where he's a great artist, all of his periods. And eventually, these will probably go up in value. So it's a good way to get in. But when this painting arrived, I mean, my partner and I were almost gagging. We were like, oh my god, look at those colors. And then one of our designers put it in a staged uh, apartment and I was shocked at how beautiful it looked and it gave me a whole new sense of this painting and I and will not look at it the same. It's still for sale, but, <laughs> but hey. I mean also, also, if you pictured that room without that yeah. piece of art in it, it's like wah, wah. It's but about the art. She loves the art, Hadastam, but she loves art and she will make it a focus. I think that's me. Okay. Yeah. So now we're going to open to the public. Um, we can have a few questions. We're a bit over time, but I'm sure mm -hmm. some of you may have something to ask. Please go ahead. Um, do you see um, trends in framing? Do you want to take that? Trends in Rebecca framing. Should answer a question. I, yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> it depends on the client. It's kind of like the artwork. It depends what the room is. So for me, I feel like there's less framing now with contemporary works than there mm -hmm. used to be, but some people like to add a big old master frame to, I mean, really, you can speak to this. Uh, I mean, don't you think it's up to the client to? It, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I've seen white frames come back in. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll sort of speak to I'll use that as an excuse to say what I think people do wrong with framing a lot. <laughs> I think people don't listen to their framers enough. I think they sometimes frame for the room instead of the piece. Um, I also think people tend to underframe something. I think they use wimpy mats. I'm, I, I've actually, uh, and a fr framer is a very personal relationship. I've had fights with framers, like, I want the mat bigger, and they're like, that's ridiculous, and I'm like, I know what I'm doing, and, you know, <laughs> and it comes back in, and they're like, yeah, you're kind of right, because, you know, it, because I knew where it was going, I knew what I wanted to sell, I mean, I love a tiny image, like, you were talking about, like, you know, a small, big piece, yeah. I love framing a small image in a very grand way, because of where it's going to hold its own, and also so that that image can clear what's happening on the table beneath it, and so there's, there's overlap with what's happening beneath it, but it's not, it's not covering up the art. So um, I, I went off a tangent, but on my personal framing agenda, but um, I would say white frames. But I do, <laughs> the other thing that I heard too, I mean, it's that with photography, with black, white photography, that it used to be kind of a knee jerk, okay, we're gonna go with black frame. And then I've been more, I've been noticing that more people are, are erring towards white frame, but I find that you can't really make those decisions without the wall, because white frames, sometimes mm -hmm. they end up looking, they don't do a service to the room or the artwork, so I don't even know how, I guess back to what Patrick was saying, I mean, it's just all this one, you know, tapestry, but I do, th I think there probably are more trends that we know about, I mean, that we don't know about that are. I mean, a good frame, it's all, to me, I go back to, it's about the artwork. I believe if you're choosing the artwork for the artwork, then you need to frame it appropriately, so it's about the work of art. And then you do notice the frame, like it's, it's well chosen, but it's not about that, so. You were, you were talking about the brass frames as indicative of the 70s that they were dated, so. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, I think you have designed a part, uh, a designed house.
else. You want everything to be top of the line. And some of those, like currently our show in our gallery right now, some of the, the paintings are older from the 50s and some of the frames are from the 50s. And I think they can be updated. So it's right. more of an update maybe than. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, Elizabeth, I would think that you have the most difficult job because you are working with interior designers and clients. Um, quick question. How many artists do you actually, <coughs> uh, do you have to hit that you can show? That was a quick question. For instance, I once was speaking to an art consultant who said, I'm not going to uh, pick up another artist because I'm dealing with 2,500 artists. That's a lot. Yeah. So how many artists do you think? <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I mean, I don't, wow. I mean, I pay studio visits ev at least every week. I'm not nearly at 2,500, so maybe I'll be saying that at 2,500, <laughs> but right now I just feel that, I, I just never want to say no to a situation. I want to know that I, I have access to photography, to media artists, to you know modernists, contemporary modernists, estates, whatever. So I, it's sort of a, um, but, but you know, that I then have to encourage the artists to contact me every once in a while so I don't forget them because I can't keep it all in my head. Um, but I do think there's, uh, I need to be more informed and more informed and more informed. And it's actually what is the pleasure of my job too. Those studio visits are really rich. That's what art is. It never ends for us. I feel like it's constant. But if, you know, you're starting from here and you've got to narrow it down. Uh huh. So how do you, in a, in a, matter of, a small amount of time, able to, to narrow that down? Like you said, you'll show JPEGs and all of that, but you really, to get to that point where you say, okay, this is where we're gonna go, here's a few artists, let's leave it at that. Mm -hmm. That could be a logical long amount of time. Well, you know, I think it's already narrowed down because someone's coming to me. Because I, I sort of have my own idea, you know, it, things get filtered through me. As I said, you know, there are artists who I really love. It's not like I won't, sh well, no, if I don't love the artwork, it ain't gonna come from me, it really <laughs> isn't. So, um, so people are going to, like anybody, you, you go with an interior designer, you go with any kind of person in the trade whose work you sort of have an affinity with. So it's already somewhat edited down, but um, it's true, I have to make these decisions um, because if you give somebody too many choices, they just don't get anything. They don't make any decision at all. So. You sort of pretend that that's all that's available. Mm -hmm. uh, if no one questions you, then you're in good shape. Well, it's always factors, and, and though. It's like yes. budget. So it's like you may want a Picasso. They mm -hmm. may say they want, but they can't. But so you go find, so you know you need a style like that. And then you just keep, everything keeps narrowing down. And then you may be working with a particular artist, but they, they may, may only have certain sizes or something available right now, or you wait. So it's, I feel like it gets narrowed much easier than you think, probably. <laughs> Right, and I think also as the, the relationship develops with the designers, you already kind of know their aesthetic. As you mentioned before, you knew it that work was for certain designers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important as well. Um, we will open one more question, please. Yes. So interior designers today have skills um, to put things into their drawings. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about JPEGs, so they can insert them into the perspectives and elevations and interior. Sections. Do you see a lot of that being used, or do you just think of that? You know, feeding interior design projects, <laughs> work quick into their drawings to see. Yes. Work Sometimes we do it too, but we don't do it well. Right. Try, but we don't. We don't have time. You know, I'm talking to people coming in, so I'd rather you guys do it and do it properly. And but yes, yes. Oh, it's so important. I have found that, that it makes a big difference for somebody to at least to get to the next step where they say, yes, I would like to see that brought to my home on approval, to see it photoshopped or, you know, in design above, you know, the, whatever, the, the buffet in the, the entry hall or whatever the, the piece of furniture is. It, it really helps people visualize. <laughs> and I just, size, the sorry. scale, the yeah. scale. I meant to say that in the JPEG, it's like, you know, how big is that? Nobody knows until. Mm -hmm. And just to conclude our panel discussion, I have a question to Christine. Do you feel people are still intimidated on, on getting inside an art gallery and walking around uh, and things feeling inspired? I think we all are. 
We all walk into those places. I have a small gallery on 24th Street. Across the street from me, there are places where you cannot find the front door. <laughs> okay, so I mean, yes, if you can't find your way in, yes, there's some level of intimidation, but that, that's what I mean about find, <laughs> like, you know, relationships. It's about relate, right. But that's where the internet has yes. become a great tool because you can use, you know, I, I won't walk into a gallery even now sometimes, but I will, without hesitation, email them and say, I saw this artist on your, like, give me an idea of availability, you know, is there anything else similar? And then you can, then you, ha then you start a relationship with whoever answers your email. Sometimes, sometimes people don't answer your email, but um, it, it gives, it gets you a, a virtual foot in the door. So it's, uh, the internet has been a great tool because you get to see it, you get to see, you know, installation shots are really important. Um, but it's, it's a great way of sort of leveling the playing field and saying, okay, you know, I don't want to walk into a giant white room in Chelsea where someone's sitting at a desk in the back. That's like weird to me, but I'll send you an email. I have to say one other thing. You'd be surprised how much, how many galleries want you in there now, the interior designers. Where, when I worked at a gallery um, in the before the <laughs> crash, booth, I mean, we were very friendly to and welcoming to people. Anyway, but now I think you're so valuable. I mean, they really want. They want the business, they need the business, except for Larry Gagosian. <laughs> and so but you should not, you should feel the importance of, of what you bring and that, that you are respected and, and very much welcomed and you and your, what, you know, your clients as well. And you can and buy over off, you know, you can buy internet, yeah. you know. And the other thing is, as an interior designer to a gallery, you represent recurring revenue that, mm -hmm. a, that an individual buyer, unless they're a, you know, a known collector. I mean, I can I can go to Christine and say like I have this project and I might have you know six and more the students future. also because we are the future. Are yeah, the future. absolutely. So that's well, clear. Know. I mean, you know, yes. you've got a lot of, we all have different clients. You'd be surprised. You think you know everyone, and then somebody comes in with a new client. You know, there's always new yeah. budding. So yeah. yes, there's an intimidation. They right. should be intimidated by you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you, every single one of you, oh. Patrick, Elizabeth, and Christine. They've been extremely helpful through this process and putting this panel discussion together. <laughs> I also want to thank every single one of you for being here tonight. This is so important for us. We are extremely honored that this is a success, successful event. And this is all, what it's all about. It's been a struggle at start to get people engaged. But once we did that, now events are coming and we're doing that for the benefit of our design community. So thank you so much for coming tonight. <laughs> now there's a lovely reception downstairs. Please join us. Let's have a glass of wine and cheer for this day.